All right. So y'all let me know. Can y'all hear me? <clears throat> mic check, mic check, mic check. All right. It's showing my mic is working. So it's showing that my mic is working. Mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check. Can y'all hear me? All right. So my mic is working according to uh, the app. <clears throat> the app here. Mic check, mic check. All right. <clears throat> so John, you hear me now? You guys hear me now? Since I don't even hear my phone now. Let's see. All right. Okay. So yeah, here we go. Here we go. All right. So what about the, is this screen size? Okay. Or do y'all need me to increase it? All right. So what about the, is this screen size? Okay. Or do y'all need me to increase it? Put a, put a two, put a two. If you want me to increase the screen size, if it's okay like this, put a, put a, two, put a one. All right. Oh man. Okay. Who knew this would be so complex? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? All right, y'all. Let's get going. <clears throat> so let's get into it. All right. So I'm gonna start. I'm going to start back here. All right. So I'm going to start. All right. You know, let's keep going. I'm going to start back here. At the highlight, the bottom of the left side. All right. Okay. So here we go. All right. Okay. And is it for the pimps and the parasites of the Godhead to call themselves ministers of the gospel of peace and to pretend that to them is committed the word of reconciliation, canting out which their superfluous nonsense be ye reconciled to, <clears throat> to God while they deny my better title to be considered as a minister of reconciliation. When I say, be ye reconciled to the devil, ye never had a quarrel with the other fellow. <clears throat> this is really important, y'all. Really, really important. So I'm going to give y'all the heads up so nobody gets spooked out who hears this. The author is developing a case that the Christ figure, well, that whole trinity, the Christ figure and the father, and the devil are the same person. <clears throat> That's what he's doing right now. So he's being sarcastic. Okay, so now let's see if he's gonna prove this, all right? So let's see. Be ye reconciled to the devil. Ye never had a quarrel with the other fellow. But my master has been treated with the utmost indignity. Revile him, revile not him, against whom even the archangel Michael when he disputed about the body of Moses. Doest not bring a railing accusation. No, he doest not. For the best feather in his archangel, archangelic wing, he does not. Or my great master would, like an eagle in a dove coat, have, trust, have thrust him for his eternal or infernal pit and cast him down to our great kitchen fire. Revile not him, that he's talking about, revile not the devil, whom your own scriptures expressly acknowledge to be the capital G-O-D of this world. <clears throat> and whom should this world worship but the capital G-O-D of this world? 
the spirit which now ruleth in the children of disobedience. And I can tell you of the children of disobedience that there is a devilish large family of them. But had ye seen my master's royal court, as I have seen it and can show it to you, okay, well, let's see if he's going to prove it. How would your admiration teach you to scorn the state and pomp of earthly sovereigns? Where? So let's go ahead and read this poem. High on the throne of royal state, which far outshone the wealth of Ormus or of end, or where the gorgeous east with the richest land showers on her king's barbaric pearl and gold. Satan exalt, exalted set, Ian he, who led the embattled Sephirim to arms under his conduct and in the dreadful deeds, fearless endangered heaven's perpetual king and shook his throne what though in the field was lost, all was not lost, the unconquerable will. And study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit nor yield. And what is more, not to be overcome. This glory never could his wrath or might extort from us. You know, I think you would have had to been alive at the time. <clears throat> Maybe these poems that he's citing, Maybe they were popular in his day, but I don't have a clue what he's talking about. And in, in, in most of these poems, I don't have a clue, uh, but we'll, we'll make do, all right? Let's, let's keep going. <clears throat> so the next paragraph, I entered thus in medias res into the midst of the subject at once, because so does the text I treat where you should observe. So let's go to the next page. All right. Let's go to the next page. Oops. All right. So here we are. To which you should observe a fact which should never escape your critical remembrance. That the devil, where he is first mentioned in the New Testament, for he is never once mentioned by that name in the singular number in the old is or the devil is introduced to us as an absolutely old acquaintance with a familiarity as gross as if the evangelist had calculated that the idea of the devil would come as natural to us as folly to a fool. So in other words, the author is saying that the devil as presented in the New Testament was not, was not presented in the Old Testament. So in other words, the house of Yasharala didn't know this devil that's in the New Testament, okay? But the New Testament writers present the devil as though our ancient ancestors should have automatically known who the devil is, but that's not the case according to the author. Okay, so let's continue. As if we should not be astonished, should not want to know who the devil was, but be ready at once to accost him as our country cousin with an aha, how do you do devil? You come to town? How did you leave our friends in the low countries? Or as if the devil himself needed no further introduction to us, right? As, as, as though our ancestors knew him, that's what he's saying. Then at once to bounce in upon us like Paul Pry with his, I hope I don't intrude. Now ye, not me, not to know me, argues yourself unknown. A proof of this then, which imagination could conceive no clearer, that the gospel has no claim to be called a revelation. Okay, well, that's interesting. So he's saying the gospel is not a revelation. It's nothing new. So let's read on. That it has no character of originality, no feature of anything that was new to the ideas of men. Okay, so he's, he's saying in a roundabout way that the gospels are a plagiarism. 
he said that in the other uh, earlier parts of his book, uh, and he proved it. So let's continue. That it was not written, and by no possibility could it have been written till as many ages as you please, after all the follies and superstitions of which it treats. <clears throat> So let me check the chat real quick to see if there's anything. Make sure y'all can still hear me. Give me one second. I just want to make sure y'all can. Oh, there's an echo. All right, let's see. John says it's loud and clear. All right, so everything is still good. Gary James says there's an echo. Hold on, let me let me see if I can do something about it real quick. Give me one second. <clears throat> All right. Oh, we get it together. We get it together. So let me let me put the highlight where we're gonna start. Uh, okay. So let's start. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we're gonna start here. No feature. We're gonna start at no feature. Okay. So let me get. Let me find that. All right. No feature of anything that was new to the ideas of men, that it was not written, and by no possibility could it have been written till as many ages as you please, after all the follies and superstitions of which it treats were deeply and ear and in and in okay, so and in ineradicably rooted in men's mind and their priest had thoroughly played the devil with them all right so the, in other words the priest thoroughly deceived them because there is nothing new in the gospels but the priest presented the story as though it was a new story all right so the priest deceived them okay so let's continue <clears throat> all right faith may dream oops let me see yeah Faith may dream what it will of the originality of these writings, but this is internal evidence that they could not possibly be original. Written whenever they were, the story was up before. If I were to name an evidence stronger than any other of the necessarily demoralizing, depraving, and vitiating tendency of this devilish gospel, I would point to its soul debasing, honor killing influence on the mind of those who call themselves Unitarian Christians and free thinking Christians who are for pretending to be Christian still after finding out that the devil upon whom the whole Christian doctrine is entirely founded is a purely imaginary being okay y'all so the author is saying that the devil doesn't exist he's imaginary all right now he also said that the whole christian faith whether catholic baptist methodist whatever it might be all of these christian religions are founded on the eye uh, on the idea of there being a devil okay That's what he's saying. They're all founded on the idea that there is a devil. So if there is no if there is no devil, if the author can prove that the devil is imaginary, then Christianity has a huge problem. Okay, so let's see what we find. Let's see if he can make the case. All right. <clears throat> so let's continue. That there never was any. Well, well, let me let me put the highlights so y'all can follow. So let's start here. Let's start back there. <clears throat> so upon whom the whole Christian doctrine is entirely founded. It is purely, it is purely a imaginary being that is the devil. That in reality, there is no devil. That there never was any devil. And that all the positive declarations of scripture that seem to speak of the existence of such a person as that's the devil are allegorical, all right? So they're made up, metaphorical, 
anico, anagogical, oratorical, rhapsodical, categorical, and all the other oratoricals <laughs> that mean in plain English, there are there are downright lies. So let me let me say that again. In plain English, according to the author, all of these references about the devil are outright lies. All right, so this author has a lot to prove. He's got a lot to prove. Let's continue. But there is no part of the gospel story related with greater appearance of historical truth and narrative simplicity than this of the temptation of Christ. The pretense then, that is, that it occurred only in a vision. Okay, so when I was in Christianity, I had a real problem with this. It didn't make any sense to me. It made absolutely no sense to me. Let me read it again. But there is no part of the gospel story related with greater appearance of historical truth and narrative. Simplicity than this of the temptation of Christ, right? The devil takes him up to a high mountain, okay, a, an extremely high mountain, and he sees the whole world. My problem was <clears throat> at that time, how could he see all the kingdoms of the earth if the earth is a circle, right? So if he's on the top, how can he see what's what's underneath his feet, right? If the If the earth is a sphere, okay, well, some people will say, okay, well, the earth is flat. All right, well, if you say the earth is flat, he'd have to turn in a circle, right, to be able to see all the kingdoms. But if you go that high up, can you breathe oxygen? I don't know. I, I just always, that never made sense to me. That defied reason, okay? But anyway, let's continue. The pretense then that it occurred only in a vision, okay, so the religion that I was involved in they taught that it was also a religion, a, a, a vision rather. They taught that it was a vision. I don't know how the other Christian churches or organizations teach this, uh, but the one I was in said it was a vision, okay? The pretense then <clears throat> that it occurred only in a vision, all this appearance of historical truth and narrative simplicity, notwithstanding is a pretense that when advanced by men who profess and call themselves Christians only serves to show what unprincipled and dishonest men their Christianity has made of them. So he's going to get into this discussion. He's going to explain himself in the next paragraph. But here's the thing. If the temptation of Christ was a vision, how is it that other stories or events in the gospel are not also visions? Because what this allows the, the pastors, the priests, the Moshe's to do is to pick and choose what's a vision and what actually happened in real life. Y'all follow me? And see, that's not good. How are you going to pick one thing and say it's a vision? And then you pick another thing and you say, no, that's historical. It really happened. So that's a problem. That's a real problem. If, you, if you're thinking and using your mind. Let's go to the next paragraph, which is here. For sure, sirs, to maintain that this portion of the gospel was visionary, while any other part of it was real, is nothing more nor less than to make it historical or visionary at your own option to make of it a nose of wax and mold it to fashion your fancy. In other words, the, the author is saying, well, <clears throat> if you can just determine what's historical and what happened in a vision, well, you can create your whole doctrine. And that's what we see, right? We see these Christian religions and Hebrew Israelites creating doctrines. They decide what, what happened in real life, what was a vision. They come up with their explanations or teachings and they create these doctrines, okay? And then they differentiate themselves 
from other Christian organizations. And if you don't follow their doctrine, well, what's going to happen to you? I think we all know that, right? All right. And then people argue about doctrines. But y'all see how this doctrine stuff is very toxic. We saw a couple videos ago about how <clears throat> the translators inserted certain words to create precepts to create precepts. Okay, so now a church organization or any Bible translator can insert words in a verse and then they create precepts. And then you'll have Hebrew Israelites talking about what are the, okay, so precept that out. They don't have a clue about what they're talking about. Y'all follow me? The Greek word doesn't mean what it means in English. And they're talking about precept it out. So that's the problem with these religious leaders being able to pick and choose what's historical, what happened in a vision, and them not having any knowledge of language or linguistics, all right? So now let's continue. In other words, you are at their whim, you are at their mercy, right? If they're articulate, have a nice personality, they remind you of church or, or, or whatever, you like them for whatever reason, and you're following them, you could be creating big problems for yourself, okay? Because they don't have a clue what they're talking about. Maybe they're sincere, maybe they're not, right? All right, so let's continue. The Holy Church throughout all the world has ever received the temptation of Christ as a real event. And I am sure it is so as his crucifixion. All right, so the author is saying these religious leaders, priests, pastors, so on, has, have taught the whole world, the whole world, that the temptation of Christ really happened in history. Okay? And then they also taught that the Christ uh, being nailed upon a stake or crucified really happened in history. Okay, but let's look at this. What if the Christ's crucifixion was only a vision? What if the Christ's crucifixion was only a vision? This is what the author is saying. Now what happens to the gospel? Since you can pick and choose what happened in history and what was only a vision. Okay, so the crucifixion was just a vision. It really didn't happen in real life. All right, so now you have big problems with the Christian faith, right? because the Christ figure really was never crucified. Therefore, there's no precious blood to wash away your sins. Therefore, all of Christianity goes away no more, right? This is what the author is trying to say. So let me start again from the top. The Holy Church throughout all the world, all right, the Holy Church would be the Catholic Church, has never received the temptation of Christ as as real an event, and I am sure it is so, as his crucifixion. Y'all see that? What gives them the right to choose? What gives them the right to choose that this temptation of Christ is a vision and not history, or is history and not a vision? What gives them the authority to do that? Let's continue. <clears throat> And so much more important than that, that while it requires us to keep but one day's fast in commemoration of Christ's death, it enjoins a 40-day abstinence in commemoration of his temptation, right? He didn't, the Christ figure didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. So now they're saying that this is a vision. Other, other religious organizations, they say, no, it really happened in real life. The organization I was in, if I recall correctly, said that he really did fast for 40 days and 40 nights. They said that that was historical. But what gives them the right to decide? Okay, and then how can you trust that? All right, so let's continue. <clears throat> All right, so and would have us expect our eternal salvation, not more from the merit of his precious death and burial or from his glorious resurrection and ascension, 
then from his baptism, fasting, and temptation. And there's a lot of Christianities who was uh, uh, Christian organizations who would say his shed blood. That's the, the value, right? They would say the shed blood. Okay. So let's continue. As in the form of incantation, for the first Sunday in Lent are these words, O capital L-O-R-D, who for our sakes did fast 40 days and 40 nights. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, says our text, he was afterward in hungry or hungered. But sure that this miracle that any of us could have beaten. Now, y'all pay attention to this, okay? Really pay attention to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some insight on something. Where the highlight is, uh, focus on this real quick. Focus on this real quick. I'm gonna give you some insight, all right? This is valuable, at least in my opinion, this is valuable. Let me read this again. So now, the here we are. The Christ figure fasted 40 days, 40 nights. He ate nothing, he drank no water. He didn't eat anything, okay? Now listen what it says. But sure, that was a miracle that any of us could have beaten. In other words, any of us could have fasted 50 days and 50 nights, 60 days and 60 nights, right? We could have fasted longer than 40 days that the Christ figure fasted. Notice what he continues to say. For if you or I had fasted twice as long, we should have not been afterward hungry. We could have kept it up to all eternity. So what the author is saying is that if you fast for 41 days, 51 days, 61 days, you won't be hungry. You won't be hungry. Well, guess what? I know that this is true because I fasted for 45 days and I was not hungry. In fact, after about the fourth or fifth day of my fast, I no longer felt hungry, even when I saw food, even when I smelled food, I had absolutely no desire to eat. There was no hunger, all right? So I never thought about this until I read this on the page here. Why is a Christ figure feeling hungry after 40 days? Now, let me explain why this happens. <clears throat> Because when you fast, here's what's gonna to happen to your body. Before your fast, your body is using sugar, glucose as its energy source, all right? It uses sugar or glucose to make energy. But when you don't eat, when you fast on the fourth or fifth day, your body is gonna shift. It's gonna stop using glucose to make energy and it's going to start using fat to make energy. So now the fat that you have stored in your body, your body will begin to use that fat to make energy. And then guess what? You don't feel hungry. You have no desire to eat. This is so profound to me. I never thought about this before. Never ever thought about this, but now, I'm saying that there's a big problem with this story because the Christ figure should not have felt hungry after 40 days. He should have had no hunger because his body doesn't need it, right? You're living, you're, you're, you're using your own fat to create energy. Now, guess what happens? If you are doing exercise, walking, or anything that's gonna cause some strenuous exercise, your body is going to start breaking down your muscle. It'll start breaking down muscle to supply you with more stuff to make energy with. Y'all follow me? Y'all follow me? So he should not have been hungry. So I thought that this is a huge, huge problem with this story that the author didn't, well, I guess the author kind of brought it out, right? The author does <clears throat> bring it out. So let's continue. I just wanted to share that with y'all. Let me check the chat real quick. Y'all keep uh, keep on uh, commenting in the chat. Let's see, John Walker. My problem with it was how did the writer know what happened 
and what was said between JC and the devil if they were alone. That's an excellent point, John. But you know what a Christian will say? The Christian will say the Holy Spirit told him. <laughs> Let's see, Appalachian Joel. Exactly, John Walker. Bunch of third person narratives narratives known today as hearsay excellent point appalachian joe l says wow okay gary james says scientifically and biological fact most indeed most indeed it is all right so let's continue with our with the bottom paragraph so we're, we're here where the cursor is y'all we're here all right but observe, I pray, what Christians never observe. All right, y'all, this is where paying attention to detail comes in. All right, pay attention to detail. Remember, the educational system intentionally failed to teach us how to concentrate and pay attention to detail. But let's do it now. But observe, I pray, what Christians never observe the strict letter of the text to the very letter of it, and we shall see the wonders it evolves. All right, here we go, y'all, here we go. Then was Jesus led up the spirit into the wilderness. Then, why when? There can be no sense in then, but as it has a reference to a when. <laughs> and that when you will find was immediately after John the Baptist, whose astronomical characteristics, y'all remember John the Baptist astro astrologically is Aquarius, the water bearer, whose astro astronomical characteristics I have lately so fully explained. Let me click over. So y'all think about the PowerPoint slides that we looked at in yesterday's lesson, right? So that's what he's talking about. Okay, so let me let me start again. Which I have lately, uh, characteristics I have lately so fully explained. That's what he's talking about. All right, so Aquarius, who is John the Baptist, had poured his water unto him, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him. Then, when he had been baptized, when he had been born of water and of spirit, when he had the witness of capital G-O-D spirit with his spirit, that he was truly a regenerated person. Then, and not till then, was he full right for the devil. All right, so let's see what's going on. Let's see what's going on. Let's go to our next paragraph and observe again, my master, he's talking about, about the devil. Remember he said the devil uh, never lived, the devil is imaginary. And observe again, my master, this imaginary devil, hasn't to go struggling about to fetch his pupils. The Holy Ghost brings him to him. Jesus was led by the Spirit, whether he was led by the hand, like St. Paul, or pulled by the ear, like Ezekiel, or like all other good Christians, led by the nose. <laughs> the note for what? Let me, let me repeat that. The note for our observance is that he was led up into the wilderness. And here's the Greek word. They translate this Greek word in English as up. Why not? And then this Greek word they have here, they translate it as down. So why are they translating it up in the wilderness instead of down in the wilderness? Okay, well, that's a good question. Let's continue. Where was this wilderness that the phrase should always be up into the wilderness? So now y'all remember in yesterday's video, we looked at the image of the starry sky, right? We looked at the starry sky image in our PowerPoint, remember? And all the stars are just there. There's no constellations drawn in them. And the author said that if you don't know how to 
connect the stars to make the constellations. He said, you're ignorant of it and you, and you know, you're lost. You're lost in the wilderness of the starry sky. All right, this is what he's talking about. So now let's continue. Where was this wilderness? That the phrase should always be up into the wilderness. And as St. Mark's gospel has it, quote, he was with the wild beast, unquote. And what wild beasts were they? Which were with him up in the wilderness? Which wild beasts were with him up in the wilderness? That's what he's asking. Anon, will I show you the whole menagerie? And when the tempter, this is a quote, and when the tempter came to him, unquote, that is more astronomically, when he came to the tempter, that is, to my master, that's the devil, right? For he is very, is a very tempting gentleman, I assure you. <clears throat> my master called on him for something like Christian evidence and gave him the fairest and most honorable challenge to make good his pretensions. Quote, will capital G-O-D suffer his son to be hungry? Unquote. Quote, if there be the son of capital G-O-D, command that these stones be made bread, end quote. But he could command no such thing. And so shrinks us off with a Methodist parson text of scripture, quote, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of capital G-O-D, end quote. So you see, Christian, how soon my master could make your master eat his words. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. Quote, the holy city, unquote, where is that? Observe ye, everything that is holy is devilish. <clears throat> Y'all get that? Y'all hear that? Everything that is holy is devilish. Let's continue. I want to see how he explains this. Observe ye, everything that is holy is devilish. It belongs to my master. The tempter itself is his. his. He said it, J.C. on a pinnacle of it and willing to try whether he dared work a disinterested miracle. He saith unto him, quote, if thou be the son of capital G-O-D, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thy dash thy foot against a stone. But their poor J.C. was content to sit till my good master perceived from the nonsense he was talking that his brain was beginning to swim in pity to his danger, took him down and saved your savior. <laughs> this author, he, he's funny the way he writes the things, uh, the things that he, he's very blunt. He's very blunt. Okay, so now let's consider what should have hindered sirs had my dread sovereign, he's talking about the devil, been the malignant being ye have been scandalously taught to think him, and he feared a rival in the Galilean boy. So he's saying that if the devil was this horrible, evil, wicked person, uh, why didn't nothing happen to the Christ figure up in the mountain? Why didn't he do something to him? That's what he's saying. So let's continue. But that he should have seized the young usurper by the nape of the neck with the grip of Hercules on Antaeus and dashed him off with a down, down to hell. And I say, I sent thee thither. So the author is saying again, well, if the devil is so bad, now, now remember, remember the author has said that the devil is an imaginary creature. He doesn't he never lived. He's just imagination, right? Like your children might have, like a child might have an imaginary friend, okay? So he's saying that why didn't this devil 
try to throw the Christ figure, JC, off the rocks or do some other type of harm to him, right? To, and then send him to hell, okay? That's what he's saying in a sarcastic way. So let's continue <clears throat> where the highlight is. Oops, so we'll start here. But was it so? No, nothing like of it. And with your Christian justice, as if to show what is indeed the truth, that a thorough Christian never knew what justice meant. You have charged my sovereign cap, uh, lowercase l-o-r-d with every vice that you could think of, while you cannot prove against him a single imperfection. Is he the jealous capital G-O-D that would visit the sins of the fathers upon the children? Is he the child killer? Must he have bloody sacrifices to propitiate his own irritable temper? No, with loving kindness not to be surpassed, with generosity not to be equal. He takes me, his hungry pupil, and as Milton, who was certainly inspired, if ever a man was, expressly assures us, set before him a banquet, compare to which the intended feast at Guildhall would have been but a banyan day. All right, so let's go ahead and read this uh, poem. I'm, I almost know in advance, I'm not gonna know what this poem is talking about, but let's go through it, uh, see what we can get, if anything, from it. A table, richy spread in regal mode, with dishes piled, and meats of noblest sort, and savor fowl and game, in pastry built or from the spit or boiled, all fish from sea or shore, fresh lit our purling brook of shell or fin, an, ex an exquisitest name for which was drained, Pontus and Lucran Bay and Afric coast, and at a stately sideboard by the wine. That fragrant smell diffused and order stood with fruits and flowers from a Amalthea's horn. Well, I understood that. He's talking about a, a nice dinner, a nice banquet. <laughs> so let's go to the next page. Let's go to the next page. All right. Okay, so here we are. So we'll start at the top. And ladies of Hesper Hesperides, more fair than thought could think or love could wish them fair. All right, now let's go to the next paragraph. Quote, this was no dream, unquote, says Milton. He's talking about the vision, right? The temptation of the Christ on the mountain when the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain. This was no dream, says Milton while our own must dis most distinguished bishop of London has translated from the Greek prodicus, the words of the temper of the temp hmm. from the Greek prodicus, the words of the temper, which our more frigid gospel has left our imaginations to supply. My master said, quote, now, Will I give thee all thy soul's desire, all that can charm thine ear and please thine sight, all thy thought can frame or wish desire to steep thy ravished scene, senses in delight, the sumptuous feast enhanced with music sound, fittest to, to tune the melting soul to love, rich odors, Breathing choice sweet, breathing rich odors, breathing choicest sweets around the fragrant bower, cool fountain, shady grove, fresh flowers to sue, to strew thy couch and crown thy head. Joy shall attend thy steps and ease shall smooth thy bed. Okay, so what the author is saying is that this person, Milton, this distinguished Bishop of London said that the uh, 
temptation of the Christ on the mountain is actually true. And this is the quote uh, that Milton wrote that we just read. All right, now let's go to the next paragraph. Oh, what a tempting, lovely, tempting devil. Who could withstand him? And if there's anything in the tetragrammaton, that's the YHWH, and is there anything in all the tetragrammatons heavenly, in all the tetragrammatons heaven, to match the glories and felicities of our pandemonium? And will ye still continue to, ri to rival my blessed master, my capital G-O-D and savior, my imperial sovereign, the devil? Will ye still dare to call him by such degrading names as Old Scratch, Old Henry, Old Nick, the old boy, and the old one, who had been capable of growing old and who and owed a debt to nature, must long ago have paid it. But ah, oh no. So hey, y'all, on the next page is coming something that's really going to surprise you. It surprised me. It was something I didn't know about. <clears throat> but let me take a look in the chat real quick, okay? So Appalachian uh, Joe L says, yes, very true. John Walker says, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Roderick's point of view says, yes. Appalachian of Joe L says, huh? And then Gemini. So I don't know what that conversation is about. All right, y'all, this is going to trip y'all out, what we're about to get into now. At least it tripped me out. All right, it was my first time ever hearing it. Okay, so let's go into the uh, this quotation. The stars shall fade away. The sun himself shall grow dim with age. Now, y'all note that the stars shall fade away. The sun himself grow dim with age and nature sink in years. So the stars fading away, isn't that start, sound, starting to sound like fall and winter, right? The sun himself grown dim, isn't that sounding like winter, right? Nighttime hours longer than day, okay? Let's continue. But he shall flourish in immortal youth, unheard amid the war of elements, the wreck of matter and the crush, the crush of worlds. Let's continue to the next paragraph. Say ye that my master have a cloven foot. Did y'all see that? Let me read, let, let me highlight that. This is what I'm telling y'all. This gets very interesting. It says, say ye my master. What master? The devil, right? They say the devil has a cloven foot, right? That's what the Christians teach. They call him a clothing foot and, you know, whatever foul name after that. Say ye that my master hath a clothing foot and taunt ye both him and me with your evangelical jibe. Quote, how beautiful are the feet of him that preacheth the gospel. Quote, then let them that preach the gospel accept the noble challenge which I have given them to undertake its defense, <clears throat> the noble challenge which I have given them to undertake its defense. In other words, defend the gospel on terms of fair and free discussion. In other words, don't try to out talk me, right? Let's have a real conversation about it. That's what he's saying. All right, because remember a couple pages ago, he said that the religious leaders they try to create a situation where they're the only ones who can speak publicly. Okay, this is what he's referring to. Now, let them come and stand foot to foot. <laughs> let them come and stand foot to foot. Note that. Let them come and stand foot to foot. I got to, I have to highlight that. Okay, he, this has meaning, y'all. Let them come and stand foot to foot with me. Let them come and stand foot to foot with me and see how soon, and see how soon they should find themselves defeated. 
Notice how he spelled defeated. Now, remember, he's saying his master is the devil and the devil is clothed in foot. Right. That's what the Christians say. So the author is saying, let these religious leaders, your Moshe, your pastor, your reverend, your priest, your imam, let them come to the altar and stand foot to foot. OK, now you look at look at their feet. Are their feet the same? This is what the author is saying. The author is saying your foot is the same as my foot is the same as the devil's foot. Clothing, clothing. All right. So now let's see him develop this idea. For by my master's honor and the solution of that enigma, that's a tricky story, would I convict them of being as ignorant of the real meaning of the gospel as if they didn't know a great A, that's a capital letter A, from a bull's foot, from a bull's foot. It's clothing, right? Clothing. <clears throat> let's go to the next paragraph. But as a mistake in a matter which concerns your souls, look at the spelling, look at the spelling, S-O-L-E-S, -E that's the soul of the foot. The author is making many, many references to the soul of the foot and being cloven footed. But as a mistake in a matter which concerns your souls, S-O-L-E-S, -E may be very serious or may be a, various seri a very serious matter at last. But as a mistake in a matter which concerns your souls, S-O-L-E-S, -E may be a very serious matter at last. To the law and to the testimony. And judge for yourselves whether the cloven foot belonged to my master or to yours. The author is saying that the Christ figure and the father in the New Testament are cloven footed. Get that. The author makes the claim that the Christ figure, that the Christ figure and the father to whom the Christ figure uh, prays is cloven foot. <clears throat> Let me read it again. This, this is astonishing. Put something in the chat if y'all ever heard this before. Have y'all ever heard that Jesus Christ and the Father, capital G-O-D, are both cloven-footed? The devil is cloven-footed. I think we all heard that. But the author is saying that the Christ figure and the Father is also cloven-footed. And what's significant about this Father deity, capital G-O-D, the Father, well, guess what? The house of Yasharala, the house of Yasharala in the Old Testament never referred to the Most High as Father. That didn't come about until Isaiah. I think Isaiah referred to him once as Father. And it's my opinion that that in Isaiah is Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8. The Most High always spoke of the house of Yasharala as an adopted child, an adopted son, whereas the nations, the nations always refer to their deities as a father. The connection between the nations and their deities, this would be the giants, y'all, the Nephilim, etc. These were people who were born from them. Okay, so for example, the Nephilim, the angels came on earth. They had sex with women. Those women had children. Well, guess what? Those women probably also had other children. And so now that Nephilim has brothers and sisters. Y'all follow me? So there is a genetic family relationship between the nations and their deity. But with us, we were adopted by the Most High. There is no genetic connection to us and the Most High. That's the point I want y'all to, to, to get out of this, all right? So the author makes the claim that this father, capital G-O-D, and J-C, the Christ figure in the New Testament, are both cloven-footed, just like the devil. Let me read that again. 
but as a mistake in a matter which concerns your souls, S-O-L-E-S, that's the sole of your feet, may be a very serious matter at last to the law and to the testimony. And judge for yourselves whether the cloven foot belonged to my master, who is the devil, or to your master, who is JC and the father. If I see that. Okay, now let's continue. Whether the cloven foot belongs to my master or to yours. When your prophet Ezekiel, describing the person of capital G-O-D himself, says, says that, quote, his legs were straight legs, but the sole, that's S-O-L-E, of his foot was the sole of a calf's foot, end quote. Ezekiel, describing the person of capital G-O-D himself, says that his legs were straight legs, but the sole, that's S-O-L-E, of his foot was the sole of a calf's foot. Now, a calf's foot is cloven. Somebody in the comments, can y'all Google search this verse <clears throat> and put that verse in the chat, please? This is from Ezekiel. It says here, when the prophet Ezekiel describing the person of capital G-O-D himself. So Ezekiel is describing capital G-O-D himself. Says that his legs were straight legs, but the sole of his foot was the sole of a calf's foot. That is a cloven foot. Okay, and who is this G-O-D? This is the Tetragrammaton. This is the deity that they are calling amongst the Hebrew Israelites, Yahuwah. Judaism calls it Yahweh, all right? And the various other names for Y-H-W-H, cloven foot. Somebody go in the chat, please, so I don't have to. Somebody type that in and, uh, and put that verse, Ezekiel, in the comment section so people can have it. All right, so uh, Gary James says, sound is clear. Uh, Appalachian Joe L says, just one. Uh, Roderick, Roderick's point of view says, okay, I'll leave out and come back. All right. Roderick's point of view says, dang, how he came up with that. Appalachian Joe L, no. So, hey, can y'all still hear me? Somebody, all right, that's good, I hear you. So somebody put this verse in the chat, y'all. Let me highlight it. Somebody find this verse in, Zeke, in Ezekiel, please, and put this in the chat. Here's the highlight. Just type it in, type in Bible verse, and then type this verse in and put it in the chat. How many people knew that the Tetragrammaton, the deity, the Tetragrammaton is cloven foot? <laughs> Put a one in the chat if you knew that the Tetragrammaton deity is cloven-footed. If you believe the, uh, the uh, prophet Ezekiel, put a one in the chat. If the deity YHWH is cloven-footed and you knew it, all right? Put a two in the chat if you did not know that YHWH it's cloven-footed like the devil. So both the devil and both the devil and YHWH are cloven-footed. Put a one in the chat if you knew. Put a two in the chat if you did not know. So Appalachian Joe L says, so then can this be based on the like us in Genesis? if we have no relation to this YHWH? Uh, yes, I agree with you in concept, uh, Appalachian Joe L, yes indeed. Because Genesis chapter one talks about, well, Genesis chapter one is a different creation story than Genesis chapter two. In fact, Genesis chapter one is completely different than Genesis chapter two. Okay, it's a completely different story. So we discussed this on our Saturday 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time class all the time. 
So YHWH is not the most high. That's the point I'm trying to make. YHWH is not the most high. Okay. In other words, the the uh, deity in chapter one is not the most high. Okay. In chapter two, we find the most high. Okay, let's see Roderick's point of view. In Exodus, it is written that Yasharala was his firstborn. Yes, but if you go through the story, he was adopted. There is an adoptive relationship. So you can get a very good uh, uh, understanding of this by going to a good Bible dictionary and looking it up. It has everything there. It explains everything, all the citations and everything. Appalachian Joel L says uh, he's looking for it. Okay, I appreciate that, Appalachian Joel L. Much appreciated. Yes, indeed. Yeah, Roderick's point. I never knew this until now. <clears throat> But in, in our Saturday 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time class, uh, from time to time, we do an exhaustive review of YHWH uh, or the Tetragrammaton to identify who this deity is. Um, so you're welcome. In fact, everybody here is welcome to come tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the link is in the description of this video. So you have to click on that link and register, uh, and then you'll get an email. Um, and then you use that email to enter the class in the morning. Uh, the classes are powerful, powerful. And it's, it's not church, it's not camp. You'll be coming and sitting in, in a graduate level course. I teach it like a graduate level course, and you'll love it. Trust me, you'll, you'll really, really love it. All right, so Roderick's point of view. So with adoption, would we call him father? No, our ancestors did not call him father. That didn't come about uh, until the Christ figure started it in the gospels. So this is explained, uh, if you get a good Bible dictionary, it'll explain that to you. So our ancestors never called the most high father. Only Isaiah did that, right? So it's my point of view that that's a Jeremiah 8.8 8 occurrence. It is an insertion, okay? The reason why I come to that conclusion is because our ancestors never did it. So why now all of a sudden uh, Isaiah is referring to him as father? Y'all follow me? And there's a lot of other reasons also, uh, but this is the uh, simplest reason. Okay, so Roderick's point of view. Okay, and that's true. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So this is, for me, this is profound. I'm going to start using this uh, when, when I teach this topic. I'll figure out a way to use it. All right, so let's continue. <clears throat> so it says, it says, and in Dr. Parkhorst Hebrew and Greek lexicon, may you see the cherubim, of glory shadowing the mercy seat of yahoo yahoo is a contraction right of the tetragrammaton with four heads a piece but only one leg why does he only have one leg so somebody please find uh find the verse and then copy paste it uh in the comment section so other people will have it easy They'll have easy access to it. Okay, so who's the deity? This is the mercy seat of Yahoo with four heads apiece, but only one leg. That's weird, right? But note the only one leg. All heavenly minded creatures, being as headstrong as you please, but devilish weak, I the understanding. I didn't understand that, but let's continue. But, and if a cloven foot were such disparagement, but, and if a cloven foot were such dispar disparagement, what say ye to your own apostles with their cloven tongues, of which the only conceivable use must have been to speak double? 
Wow, okay, all right. So he's saying the apostles had cloven tongues, double tongues, right? All right. And what's the use? He said they would use their cloven tongue to speak double, <clears throat> to speak double with, to say one thing and mean another. That's hypocrites, right, y'all? We we read about the uh, hypocrites in the last video. Okay. All right, so y'all see how this is coming together? All right, to say one thing and mean another. This is another case of what? Legal ease, legal ease. So the New Testament also has connection to statutory law, right, y'all? Right, right? Double tongue, cloven tongue, hypocrisy, legal ease, hidden meaning, okay? hidden meaning that you need to understand. You go into a venue calling itself a court and you're thinking they're speaking regular English, but they're not. And you are in there actually speaking against yourself, <laughs> right? Because you don't know that they're speaking a completely, those words have a completely different meaning. In other words, they have a legal meaning that you're not aware of. Okay, so to speak double with, to say one thing and mean another, of which I have heard my honorable master say in the language of pandemonium. And we see the first two lines are the Greek text, the original Greek text. And then we see the quotation in English. The man who with one thing thinks and can another tell, my soul abhors him as the gates of hell. So in other words, the man is thinking something, but he's saying, he's saying something different from what he's thinking. That's called a hypocrite or speaking double tongue. That's also called legal ease. All right. Your master could indeed bestow the gifts of tongue and your clergy have it most copiously, but mine alone could serve you up the tongue with brain sauce to it. But if you be not satisfied with my ministry as the ambassador of this satanic majesty. Now, remember, y'all, <clears throat> he's saying that this Satan, this devil is an imaginary creature. He never lived. All right. So nobody gets spooked out. OK, he continues. I'll fetch my master himself. All right. So don't get spooked out. The author has already said that this devil is just make believe by process of magical incantation let me turn the page don't get spooked out so by process of magical incantation i'll raise the devil remember there is no devil he he just imaginary and you will take his measure for a pair of shoes again he's going back to the souls s-o-l-e-s and the cloven foot of the devil, the cloven foot of the tetragrammaton. All right. So now let's continue reading. Let me see how many pages do we, can we finish this tonight? Let's see. No, we can't finish this tonight. Let me see what time is it? It's already nine o'clock. I think we've been going for about an hour and a half. 738. Yeah, we've been going for an hour and a half. So I'm going to stop here, y'all. We're going to pick up tomorrow. Uh, we will finish. We will finish this chapter. And then after we finish this chapter, we're going to go to part two. And part two, we're going to start dealing with the astronomy that make the case of what we're talking about right now. Okay. So part two deals with the orientation of the planets as it relates to Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. All right. So with that said, I am going to close out. Anybody have anything in the chat uh, that you would like to uh, share or, or you want me to read off? You have a question or a comment? Uh, please put it in the chat. And remember, uh, th uh, the, the, the questions or comments in the chat really help people who come to see this. 
Okay, it'll really, really help people who watch this tomorrow or even five or 10 years from now. Where else are people gonna get the information that we're talking about, that we're covering right here, y'all? I've never heard any of the Hebrew Israelites talk about this topic. I've never heard any Christian organization talk about this topic. In fact, and I'm not boasting, I'm not boasting at all, y'all, but I've never saw or heard anybody present what I'm presenting right now, the devil's pulpit. I haven't heard it. And when I have heard uh, or watched videos on astrotheology, they were not uh, very well explained. The presentation of the information wasn't good. Now, I don't know if that's your experience, but that's my experience. And I think what I'm doing right now is a very good, good presentation of this book. Um, so, uh, so comment, ask questions, and like and share the video. If you haven't subscribed, uh, I'd like to invite you to subscribe, especially if you feel like you learned something or something caught your interest. It really, really helps us out with what we're trying to do. Okay, which is get this information to our people. All right. So now let's go ahead. I'm going to read some of the comments here. Uh, Roderick's point of view says, okay, that's true. The New Testament did bring in a lot of new stuff. It sure did. It sure, sure did. Roderick's point of view again says, yeah, a lot of double talk in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. And see, that's the interesting thing, because these pastors and Moshe's, they use that to develop an explanation of why it's different in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. And then they call it a doctrine. And then they say they have the right doctrine because they explain that difference better, in their opinion, than some than some other church or pastor explains it. Right. So all of this stuff got to be explained. They got to explain everything. So Appel Joel L, Christian Standard Bible, their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the hooves of a calf. Y'all see that? Cloven, sparkling like the gleam of polished bronze. There y'all go. Appalachian Joel L, much thanks, Dr. Yasapa. Uh, Joel L, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, y'all keep the comments coming. Uh, because I'm reading these and I'm trying to process everything so that uh, W Nia Gospel Radio, thanks. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to present this information. Uh, we really, really need this information. So many of our people, and I know I'm not the only one, but I have friends who are in Christian, well, who are with the Hebrew Israelites and uh, they're into the New Testament, right? And they have lots of problems, but they don't know where to turn to. They, or they jump from camp to camp and they, they have problems. And my, my personal experience with uh, Christianity and the teachings in the New Testament is that they don't work. And everybody I know who, uh, when I was in Christianity, everybody I know, they had problems. Although, although they were applying what, this, what the New Testament told them, but they, their lives were in shambles. It was all messed up. So I feel sorry for them. So I think that getting this information to the people will help them make an educated, informed decision as to whether or not the Christ figure in the New Testament ever lived or is it just a fairy tale and if they should follow him and they can make a decision based upon the sciences that we've been uh, going through as we read through this material. Y'all know what I mean? They can make an informed decision because we have to return to the most high as a nation, not just as individuals, but as a nation. So if you shared this, and if you talk about this with your friends, your families, 
the people in your camp, the people in your assembly, the people in your church. If you talk about what you've been learning here, it might give them something to think about and then they'll start to learn. Because the goal is not to, to persuade anybody to stop following the New Testament. That's not the goal. The goal is to get them educated so that they can make an informed decision. And if they have problems in their life that might be related to deities that, they're, that they have surrounded themselves with and who are operating in their lives, they can then make whatever decisions that they need to improve their life and return to the most high, how they see fit. But the problem is right now, they don't have this information, okay? But everybody hears at one point, at one time or another, that Christianity is false or Christianity is worship of the stars. Everybody hears about this, but nobody has a, a thorough education on the topic, right? Or at least a functional knowledge of it, like we're getting in the classes or in these videos rather that I'm presenting right now. So I, I hope that everyone here is learning. Um, I hope you all are enjoying um, and give me feedback in the comments on what I can do to improve your experience because this is a learning experience and I want to make it as, as valuable as possible to you. So just share with me. I won't be offended by anything that you might say. I'll use it to improve. Okay, so Appalachian Joel L says, where does Ibriath come from? This is our language that we initially spoke before there ever was a biblical Hebrew, before there ever was a Mishnah, before there ever was a modern Hebrew, our ancestors spoke Ibriath. All right, so <clears throat> of course it comes from the family of nations of the Canaanites. Now, I've often said and I've shown that the house of Yasharala, who religion calls Israelites, we are in fact Moors, M-O-O-R-S. According to Genesis chapter two, correlate that with the meaning of land in Black's Law Dictionary. Okay, you'll see that land in Black's, Black's Law Dictionary, you can go to the fourth edition. You'll see that one of the synonyms of land is Moors, M-O-O-R-S. Land and moors are the same. Okay, so if you are an ancestor, I'm sorry, if, if your forefather, your ancient forefather, is that man who was created in Genesis chapter two, you are by definition a moor. End of story. Nothing else to talk about. You're a moor. Okay. All right, let's see. So let's see. Uh, okay, so Appalachian Joe L says. As it relates to the Quran, Septuaginta, are they all related as fiction? I don't know anything about the Quran. My uh, my mother's husband was uh, in the Nation of Islam, so I had some exposure with the uh, with that. I never joined it, but I you know I've been to the mosque and you know as a child and as a teenager. Um, but I really never read the Quran. And the Greek Septuaginta, uh, watch the video that I did um, on, on Zion Law School, uh, the channel you're on right now, Zion Law School on YouTube. There's a video that says all Abrahamic religions are a hoax. I did that video with uh, on the House of Reawakening Minds with Dr. G. It's on it's on Zion Law School. Watch that video and you will get the answer to your question about the Greek Septuaginta. Okay. The story goes that there were 70 elders who were called to Israel to translate uh, the ancient documents. And the uh, not 70 but 73. They call it Septuagint because they, they reduce it to 70. But that's an impossibility because the promised land 
was a burning waste, a complete desert. It could not support life. But to get the details, watch that video. All right, so Appalachian Joel says, so wait, the story about going up to the mountain top and getting the Ten Commandments, then they came down and they made a calf idol related. Well, now that, that calf idol has to do with, with the uh, Egyptian deity, right? The calf idol has to do with the Egyptian deity. All right. So not with uh, what we're talking about. But the calf idol, of course, does have a cloven, cloven foot, right? Yes, indeed. Okay, so Appalachian Joe L says Moses going up. Roderick's point of view says I signed up. Are the videos in order or do I watch the ones of interest? Yeah, Roderick's point of view, uh, thanks a lot for supporting. The videos are in order. So um, the knowledge builds uh, on each other. So one cop's concept builds upon a concept, et cetera. So you have to watch them in order, okay? Yeah, they have to be watched in order. All right, so what just happened with the chat? All right. So yeah, they have to be watched in order. Uh, let's see, what do we have? Let's see. Yeah, uh, Roderick's point of view. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the support. Um, the course is phenomenal. You're gonna learn a tremendous amount. And all of this is, all the skills that you're going to uh, be introduced to are transferable to English or whatever language that you speak. Okay, Roderick's point of view says, I've heard that the calf is related to Taurus the bull. It could be, um, but you know, I have to check because y'all remember, we have to always consider Jeremiah 8.8, 8, right? So let's go to Jeremiah 8.8 8 in the Bible Hub. We'll go to Jeremiah 8.8 8 in the Bible Hub. Um, and the first thing we should always remember is that, uh, Okay, so let me let me uh I gotta I gotta do another screen share, y'all, in order to show y'all. Oh, there it is, there it is. All right, there it is, all right. So the first thing we need to keep in mind, so we're in the Bible hub right now. The first thing we need to this is Jeremiah chapter eight, verse eight. We need to keep in mind always, literally always, Jeremiah eight eight, because these documents, our records have been used to enslave us, right? They have been used to physically enslave us and also to enslave our minds right now, okay? So let's read the Amplified Bible, Jeremiah ch uh, chapter eight, verse eight. How can you say we are wise, meaning how can you say we are applying knowledge correctly? And the law, or the instructions of the Most High is with us. And we are learned in its language. That language is Iria and teachings. What are the teachings? The teachings are the law or the instructions. What are the instructions? At essence, the Most High's instructions are natural law. The natural laws that govern the universe, that govern human relations, that govern the physical sciences, the natural laws that govern the movement of water, how insects and animals relate to each other. Y'all understand? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the next sentence reads, behold, the truth is that the line pen of the scribes have made the law into a lie. <clears throat> Give me one second, y'all. I can get some water. All right, let's get back to it. All right, so the truth is that the lying pen of the scribes, these are our ancestors. These are members of the black priesthood, the dark priesthood, okay, <clears throat> has made the law into a lie, a mere code of ceremonial observances. So what, by definition, 
are ceremonial observances. They are in fact religions. So our ancestors started Judaism, Christianity, uh, Islam, so on and so forth, along with others started these religions, okay? So with that in mind, knowing, knowing that our ancestors created these religions to capture our imaginations and control our lives and our thinking, we cannot discount anything unless we check it, okay? In the same way the author is presenting his case, we as a people need to be educated so that we can then research ourselves the same way you see this author researching. So on our Saturday class, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do this, but we do it at an even more in-depth uh, way than this author does it. Okay, we, we go deeper. It's more, more analytical than this book we're reading right now. Okay, so we all need to learn how to do this. So we accept nothing. We accept nothing that's written on a page or told to us by a Moshe or a pastor or a rabbi. We don't accept it, but we use our knowledge of linguistics and etymology of history and how to research to check to see if it's true. Okay, so that's what we all need to do. So whether or not that has to do with Taurus, I would have to check that out. I'd have to dig into it. And I highly recommend that from this day forward, nobody accept anything that a Christian or a Hebrew Israelite or any other religious person says. The first alarm should be that they're religious. That's the first alarm. Okay, they are religious, they're talking religiously, the alarms should go off. Okay, so we as a people, we need to become masters of natural law. Okay, regarding human relations, the key to natural law is do no harm. Now, do no harm, that's common sense, right? Don't start none, won't be none. Okay. So do no harm is common sense. Common sense is common law. Common law, the Republican form of government in the United States or for, that you'll see uh, uh, presented in the Constitution for the United States of North America is a Republican form of government, which is every man is a sovereign. Right? Every man is a sovereign. In other words, you make your own decisions and your rights end where it encroaches or begins to hurt somebody else. Y'all see that? See the connection? Okay. So let's continue. I'm going to look at some more comments. Roderick's point of view says, okay, I will then. Uh, that verse opened up my thinking years ago. Yes, indeed. Appalachian Joel, this is very powerful. All praises to the Most High, Appalachian Joel. Yes, indeed. All of this, all of this is connected, is connected to law. Okay? Everyone should know that constitutional republics, specifically speaking, North America, okay? Constitution for the United States of America, North America, there are divine principles in that document. In other words, natural law. Don't y'all don't y'all remember that? The natural law in the Declaration of Independence? If not, or if you want to review, I did a video. I actually read through the whole Declaration of Independence where it talks about natural law or nature and nature's capital G-O-D. We go through that. Also, importantly, all of the papal bulls, the doctrine of the, the, the collection of papal bulls that are referred to as the doctrine of discovery, these are also on Zion Law School YouTube channel. 
everybody should go to that and check that out. All right, so now what about the New Testament? The New Testament also has value if you don't follow it other than religious because there's Gnostic wisdom in these documents and statutory federal and state, uh, even local statutes and codes, they will use the Gnostic wisdom in the New Testament in these statutes and codes. So if you understand the esoteric meaning of these New Testament verses, then you have a better understanding of what's actually being said in the statutes and codes at the federal, state, and local level. Y'all follow me? So this is very, very powerful. Not only that, but they also use astrology. So you're getting the heads up. Uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Appalachian Joe L knows what I'm talking about right now. Um, but this is very powerful stuff, and we really, really need to know it as a people. All right. So everybody should memorize Jeremiah 8:8. 8, 8, be like uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, was it Nino Brown? Back in the day in that movie, was it New Jack City where he said? Nino Brown, don't trust the mother, right? Be like that. Don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody. Develop your research skills. Take advantage of the course, the 101 Ancient Ivory Act course. Learn etymology. Learn linguistics. Learn philology. Okay? That puts you in control of your own life and nobody's going to get over on you easily <laughs> right nobody's going to get over on you easily so all right so uh shalawama scholars it's a good thing that we kept this video uh fairly short uh it's two hours now um we will complete part one tomorrow and i'm excited about getting into part two and I'm gonna work on trying to find images of all of these constellations. constellations. And uh, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit. I'm gonna do the best I can. Whatever I don't find, I'll find and present in the next video, okay? Or whenever I find it, I will go back and find these. But I'm getting better and better as we go, all right? I'm getting better and better learning how to research and find this stuff, all right? Because trust me, it's not easy to find these images. The more I do this, the more I'm realizing how much they do not want us to know this information. All right. Let's see, uh, Appalachian Joe L. For the preposition as opposed by, by the, yes, Appalachian Joe L. Yup, 100%, yeah. So I'm looking forward to this, y'all. I'm enjoying it. I hope y'all are enjoying it as much as I am. If anybody wants to come in and read, just reach out to me by email. My email is uh, in the about section on the uh, on the uh, on my YouTube channel, or put it in the chat. Put your email in the chat, and I'll send you an email if you want to come in and help me read. That's fine, also. Um, also, if y'all want a call in number, so instead of texting in the chat, you can call in and then it'll be, uh, you know, you'll be in the video. You'll be able to speak your piece um, in the video. Just, I ask that you just don't come in evangelizing. Don't come in uh, saying bad things about people who, uh, who are following the Christ figure or the New Testament. You know, just be academic, scholarly if you call in. But let me know if y'all want to do that and I'll put my phone number out. All right. And then we can we can make it do what it do. And uh, uh, I'm very hopeful that we can get this to as many mores as possible, as many mores as possible. And you would think more mores would be interested in this, right? That's what I would think. Um, but hopefully as time goes, more of the Moors uh, will come in 
um, and learn astrotheology. All right, y'all, that said, I, I spoke a lot. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop speaking. Anybody have anything uh, that you want to say before we close it out? If you want to say something to get it put in the video, type it in the chat and I'll read it off. I'll give it a minute or two. And if nothing shows up, I'm gonna close the video out. All right, so I'll wait a minute or two for your comments, et cetera, if you want them in the video. And don't forget, uh, like and share the video, please. Post it on your Facebook, uh, Instagram, or I don't know what the social media stuff is, but y'all know what I'm trying to say. Uh, post it up and um, and let's make it do what it do. Let's make a goal. Let's make a goal to get a bunch of people, maybe 20 people. Let's get 20 people tomorrow here and get it jumping off in the in the comments section. All right, so I don't see any more comments in the chat, so I'm gonna close the video out. Islam and Shalawama. Thanks for joining Islam and Shalawama.